start. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to House Economic Matters Committee. Today is Thursday, March 28th. Uh, we have a total of eight bills with 12 witnesses. First up, we will do Senate Bill 85. Senator Washington, welcome back. Just want to make sure my people are here. Um, okay. Uh, for the record, Senator Mary Washington here uh, asking for your favorable report for Senate Bill 85, uh, limited worker cooperative authorization. Um, after uh, this bill will carve out a special place in state statute to legally recognize worker cooperatives as legitimate businesses that can incorporate, receive loans, run their businesses in compliant with state laws. Okay. If passed, Maryland would join 30 other states with such laws, including Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, and Virginia. And if you just allow me a couple of moments, as there is not a Senate cross file, I just want to familiarize you just very briefly with worker cooperatives, which are also called worker co-ops. I want you to know that these are businesses. <laughs> they are owned and democratically governed by their workers, okay? So these are businesses um, and they can organize in any industry. Uh, any industry can be a cooperative. A credit union can be a cooperative, a taxi, company, child care, house cleaning, solar energy, anything. We have over 30 known worker cooperatives in Maryland law. Unfortunately, now they have to operate on, as an LLC and it's not specifically consistent with their business model. Maryland already recognizes cooperatives in our statutes for specific um, types of industries. Uh, if you look at our corporate and association laws, which I'm sure you all read every night, um, we have agricultural cooperatives. We have consumer cooperatives recognized in Maryland law. We have transportation cooperatives recognized in Maryland law, uh, um, cooperatives and library corporations. So this bill just simply aims to recognize worker cooperatives in our laws. Now you'll hear from some of the people who are testifying about the benefits and why they seek this, but according to research by the Apps, uh, Aspen Institute, worker cooperatives allow for more resilient economic shocks, there's lower turnover, and there's some higher productivity. Uh, in particular, for some of you who uh, have uh, business di districts where maybe the the ownership was owned by you know a family uh, over a long period of time and maybe that family no longer wishes to operate that business. One of the options that could happen is that the employees or they could actually become the owners and and again it's just adding flexibility to the ways that uh, cooperatives can be organized. Again, this work cooperative. And statute is needed that while many there are many co-ops in our states, they are not technically recognized as cooperatives. And again, attempting to adjust their business model to our LLC statutes is really cumbersome. Okay, LLCs and worker cooperatives have different governance models. They have different business philosophies, and so they really should be legally operate, uh, operated as two distinct entities. Again, to clarify, this bill does not actively promote cooperatives over any type of business model or provide any special benefits for cooperatives. This bill simply creates a standardized legal structure. Now, as you might uh, imagine that there are other implications to this bill that what we put it forward and there were some uh, questions and comments by the comptroller's office and the business law section. We have amended the bill to address those concerns. You'll see as part of our, 
our packet that we uh, have a letter of information from the Maryland Bar, as well as the Comptroller's Office. And we worked very closely. As you can see, this is a uh, this was this bill is actually pre-filed, and so we've been working a lot to 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 make sure that we've adjusted everything. Um, recently, I believe your committee or someone reached out uh, to um, um, our uh, insurance worker insurance uh, board, and they expressed comp, uh, uh, concerns that we weren't aware of. Um, as of the last time we were looking at the bill and we've been in conversation with them and believe that their amendments would would strengthen and make a lot of sense and aren't at all um, inconsistent. Now there is a estimated fiscal note. I think we've all been experiencing uh, the fiscal note issue, but um, the fiscal note when it was passed out of the Senate said that they would need 278,000 to hire a consultant uh, to make the necessary back and changes. Again, this was approved, this bill was jointly assigned to budget and tax as well as uh, the, um, the, uh, the standing committee in finance. And it turns out that if we delay the start date, oh, and so the revised fiscal note increased it from 278,000 to 2.5 million, okay. So we had a, because they asserted that they needed to create a standalone system in order to accommodate this law change. So we certainly don't want to add any additional hurdles. So we requested an amendment to solely to delay the implementation until 2026 when they are planning to, you know, change their new vendor anyway. So while we will pass this law this year, I hope the actual changes um, needed to do it can be incorporated uh, in, at a later date, uh, and therefore it would bring the fiscal note back to the original number. And I do have a an email uh, from SDAT say, <clears throat> saying that if we delay the date, that it will return it to the original fiscal model. Again, in conclusion, we're asking for the state of Maryland to recognize cooperatives, what they stand for, let them have a, a specific space in Maryland law. Um, and for the past two years, uh, one of your members of this committee uh, and I and others have been working to uh, draft this bill. As I said, we met hours with the Comptroller's Office and the business law section. Uh, I have two panelists, uh, Anna Evans Goldstein and David Litz, who will briefly talk with you about the importance and uh, why this will serve your constituents um, as well. And I believe, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chair, I don't know if you want to hear the, the panelists first, or do you want to ask me questions, however no. you want to go. I think, Senator, we'll go to both the virtual witnesses. Uh, Ms. Sexton, can you come up as well? Because your information, we'll let her go, and then we'll have questions, if that's all right. Try to stream on this. Mr. Litz, go ahead, sir. Unmute. Thank you, Chair Wilson, Vice Chair Crosby, honorable members of the committee. Deep, deep thanks also to Senator Washington. My name is David Lids, and I'm here representing the worker owners of Water Bottle Cooperative. The Water Bottle Cooperative purchases severe fairly distressed housing in redlined Baltimore neighborhoods, then completely renovates and rents out uh, these assets. In other words, we turned crumbling liabilities into healthy, performing, affordable rental housing. We use of renovation work to hire and employ individuals recovering from addiction and incarceration or facing other barriers to employment. And the really beautiful thing is this portfolio of valuable assets we are building is owned by our workers and soon by our tenants who are predominantly single moms of color. This model I am describing is, of course, a cooperative. Our cooperative now owns 20 West Baltimore row homes. Our 25 workers now enjoy rewarding, good-paying jobs. And our work to rebuild neighborhoods like Park Circle, Sandtown Winchester, and Midtown Edmondson is just beginning. Now let me tell you how hard and confusing it has been to form a cooperative in Maryland. Because there is no state co-op law, our Maryland accountants struggle to figure out our taxes and how especially to do it in a way that doesn't expose our co-op members to complex and expensive individual tax filings. Imagine, if you will, $25 an hour painters who are told they've got to file a K-1. Because states like Colorado do have co-op law, you can imagine where all the co-op legal expertise is gathering. So now let me tell you about the $12,000 we have had to send 
to Colorado lawyers who are kind of sort of explaining to us and to our poor local accountants how we should structure our business here in Maryland. Let me also tell you how terrified we are that our workman's comp company will figure out that we've converted to a cooperative. I humbly urge the committee to take a look at the more detailed written testimony I've submitted and to vote favorably for SB 85. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Man, nobody has been that excited ever to hit the time limit. Uh, Miss Evans Goldstein, see if you can top that. Go ahead, ma'am. I'll try. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Anna Evans Goldstein. I'm here from Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy. We strongly are urging a favorable report for SB 85. Um, this legislation is the result of years of research and discussion between cooperative small business owners, legal consultation, labor, workforce development, and national leaders in cooperative business. The bill is based on the best practices of legislation already passed in 30 states across the country. Um, the Illinois statute that our legislation is based off went into effect in 2020 has already had a huge impact on small businesses in the state. So small business owners in Maryland who work cooperatively deserve the same consideration. Legal entities available to them were not made with them in mind, and it's like trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. There's multiple pain points that have impacted these businesses, sometimes to the point of not reaching break even or receiving permits. We've already have several industry specific worker cooperatives in Maryland, and we're just asking for similar treatment for worker cooperatives so that this growing sector of Baltimore, of small business ownership in Maryland is more accessible and it's recognized by state and financial institutions. The worker cooperative business model has been shown to raise standards across industries, raise wages and benefits for workers, ensure job stability, reduce turnover and spur innovation. These businesses survived the pandemic when others didn't because of their community support networks. Um, and this model is a growing one for aging business owners who want their legacy to live on and sell their business to their workers. This legislation is common sense. There's similar statutes operate in 30 other states and it has broad based support. So we urge you to pass this legislation. All right, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Sexton, do you wanna go ahead with information and then we'll take questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Jamie Sexton on behalf of the Maryland Insurance Administration. Uh, I'm here today to simply raise three items of technical input on uh, Senate Bill 85 as currently amended in its posture um, for the committee's consideration. We have been in communication with the sponsor's office who has expressed openness to addressing these very minor technical items to provide some greater clarity to the bill language. We're very grateful for Senator Washington's willingness to work with us on this um, and just wanted to go through the three items very briefly. Um, first, the reference insurance language within the bill language itself uh, appears to be housed in the wrong section of code. Um, the MIA feels that it should be housed within the insurance article um, in the provisions that address comp, um, or at the very least, it should have a cross-reference to it within the insurance article, specifically in 19403. Um, we want to make sure that it's clear in the insurance article that there's a special provision for these entities. Um, second, uh, the bill language does not appear to address Chesapeake, which is the statutorily created workers' comp insurer in the state. Um, there is a reference to Title 11 uh, on page 13 that is accurate for every workers' comp insurer except for Chesapeake, um, which is not subject to Title 11. Um, because the language doesn't have an except Chesapeake provision, it creates a little bit of an inconsistency um, within the language that we think could um, benefit from some greater clarity. Uh, happy to work with committee counsel um, and the sponsor on the appropriate mechanism to address that inconsistency. Um, and lastly, we just want to highlight one effect of the bill to ensure that it's in alignment with intent and ensure that it's on everyone's radar. Um, in that it seems that there could potentially be some confusion about what happens when an LWCA becomes an LLC with regard to workers' comp exemptions for certain members. Um, within the labor and employment article, um, there is a provision that permits members of an LLC to elect exemption if the individual meets certain requirements. So we just want to make sure that that's on the radar and that it's in alignment with the intent here. I'm happy to answer any questions, but those are our three, again, very minor technical items that we just wanted to ensure. Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Senator Washington. It's great to see you. Um, in case I um, 
I didn't catch um, all of what you described about comptroller's amendments related to tax and all that. And I was trying to read the fiscal notes as well as bill itself. Please help me understand the tax implications of this kind of uh, transition from, let's say, an LLC that can opt to be a limited worker co-op, right? What is the tap tax implication for both the workers who now own this co-op as well as for the corporation itself? Thank Again, you. Um, just saying at the um, outright that I am not a CPA or a tax attorney, but I will attempt to play one because I have spent a lot more time in the tax code than I ever had before. Uh, I will just say that I will assure you that the amendments, uh, it wasn't a, just simply a, an email exchange back and forth. My staff and my, I met with the comptroller's office with the comptroller's council and three of their attorneys who review each of the different sections. And we um, took the their recommendations about how to adjust it. So to attempt to answer the question is that most cooperatives would elect to be taxed under subtitle T and that a cooperative formed as a corporate entity can also choose to be taxed as a subtitle C, a, sub a subchapter S or a subchapter T. An LLC or partnership can choose from subchapter C, K, S or T. Um, there's also some apparent, there's a reference that we can provide to it that will probably give you a more clear um, response around this, uh, around the uh, 2021 worker cooperative law practice. Um, in terms of how the taxes are treated uh, in our bill, the amendments address CHAP subchapter T and the federal income tax and discusses how they can be treated uh, how they'll receive a special tax treatment under subtitle T. Um, it also uh, talks about uh, unemployment and self-employment taxes. It addresses that those measures. Um, let me see. Uh, da -da. I think that oh, um, it's going to allow for there to be multiple classes of members. Um, and then it addresses the capital structure of the association, the classes or types of membership, how the, so how the profits and losses are going to be allocated and distributed, the voting rights and governance rights, the methods of admission, number in terms of the managers, outlines of member contributions. follow up with the comptroller's office, but sounds like they have some options here. So thank you. Yes, yeah. and, and again, I can forward you specifically all the notes from the comptroller's office and, and the work that was done, but be assured, I wouldn't, I would never misrepresent support from any state or state agency that wasn't clear. Oh, I'm sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> no. oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know you said there were amendments, but do your amendments address the Maryland State Bar Association letter? Yes, they actually do. All so of them, because they have another letter that's addressed to us, which you know kind of says that this bill really doesn't have address some of the issues that have been raised, and that the current LLC law, if someone can elect to yeah. be taxed as a partnership or incorporated as a, right. I'm sorry, as a corporation, and therefore it would address a lot of the issues that you're trying to address. Yes. So again, with all due respect uh, to the Maryland State Bar Association's um, business, uh, we had we've had four meetings with them uh, to address uh, the concerns that they've they've raised different concerns in every meeting, and when we put in the final amendments and work the bill through our Senate committee. Prior to the vote, we did ask if there was any anything else, and we did not get this letter until about you know till a day before. Okay. Um, I think there's a difference between having a um, preference for an LL LLC structure versus. Um, allow it, we as legislators having a responsibility to create laws and policies that address the specific needs of our constituents. So attorneys are invested 
and I had this conversation with them, attorneys are invested and their job is to support the law as it is written. So they aren't thinking about possibilities or way to improve or move it along. So they also, uh, a number of the letters are, a number of the, op the opposition is sort of detailing scenarios that are outside of the purview of a, of a, of a law. You know, um, every law can't anticipate every possible scenario but the law can be internally consistent with Maryland law, uh, at, at Maryland tax law, Mar Maryland business code. And I think most importantly, we have constituents that wish to form these businesses. And without this law, their businesses are force forcing them to present themselves as a way that they actually aren't. So this law allows them to be honest, about who they are and how they organize and to also receive the full range of benefits because they aren't able to get the, to the type of um, access that they wish to get without this law. And again, this is a statewide law. You think about your, as I said in my earlier remarks that there are agricultural cooperatives that have organized to sort of mutually benefit. We have consumer cooperatives. So Maryland has made, um, has made new law to accommodate a specific need of our constituents. Yeah, I, I get that, but I mean, they're, I, I'm not an attorney. I assume their concerns are valid. They're actually saying that the proposed legislation may strip workers of workers' compensation coverage, and they're also saying that the Baltimore Bicycle Works, had they organized as a corporation versus well, uh, the partnership that I, they did organize as I, all I, their issues would have yeah, been addressed. So do you, I, I think that, I think that, uh, Ms. do you not Goldstein, agree with that statement? I think Ms. Goldstein will, is if she could answer that. And I don't agree with that statement. And I believe that the, well, again, this is why we have them here. So if that's, you know, if somebody else can answer that, but I, I just simply don't. Ms. Goldstein, can you quickly answer that question? Um, sure. If I'm understanding what the question is, I mean, my my general response is that, um, you know, we that Baltimore Roundtable for Economic Democracy, we are on the ground providing technical assistance um, and small business financing to worker cooperatives daily. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of worker cooperatives face issues that um, the MSBA seems to think are not issues. Um, and so, you know, there have been a number of businesses, not just Baltimore Bicycle Works, that have faced uphill battles when it comes to trying to fit themselves into the laws that are already existing. Delegate Wild, does that help you or no? Not really, but okay. I'll let it go. Okay. Uh, All right, Delegate Amber. If you're against the bill, you're against the bill. No, 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 no. I, I, the, the law. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, and, and thank you, Senator Washington, for bringing this bill. I, the spirit of this bill we're trying to accomplish here, I get. Um, I am a corporate attorney by trade, been doing it for seven years. And this literally what I do is form LLCs, I form corporations, I give companies and people who are trying to create companies advice on how they should form based on the goals of the business, based on uh, tax law. And, you know, I think some of the issues that have been raised by the Maryland State Bar are valid, I truly believe. But I mean, the letter the letter makes it clear they 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 want to see this possibly work if we get these amendments. I think there's still some amendments and work that might need to be done on the bill. Um, I think the, the 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 issues raised around tax classification um, and the possibility of workers being confused is valid um, because we have to realize that no matter what the comptroller says about how we do things, there's still a federal tax implication component of this work that we have to always think about. And I, I'm, that's my worry with this bill is how do you, how do you all how does this bill address the issues that, that have been raised in this letter and that, you know, reading this and, and I, I got to get through the bill and, and get through all of it and understand it a little bit better. But I'm trying to understand some of the federal tax implications, because I do believe that um, the way you can form a company. Just the example that was given earlier, like forming as a corporation would have been a better move possibly for this company, but just thinking about the federal tax implications of this bill. Are you open to the amendments that would help address some of those things that are put forth in this recent letter and is what were those conversations like informing this bill and thinking about yeah. the federal tax implications? Yeah. Because as a lawyer, 
you know, our responsibility, of course, is the Maryland law, but it's always the federal law as well, because when you have to report your taxes to the federal government, too. So I just want to get yes. your thoughts and, on that. And, and yes, and, understanding. And, and first, I, I want to um, express to Delegate Weibel, I appreciate your questions. And I, I understand. I, I think what I was expressing is my um, frustration with the difference between working out or making recommendations to come to a solution where to make something work versus presenting and moving the bar as an attempt to stop something from happening altogether. And so there from the very beginning is a preference and ideological belief about the utility of the LLC that uh, that and that worker cooperative is not uh, something that could be adapted to Maryland law, uh, despite the fact that 30 other states are doing it. So the answer is absolutely, I want to work with this committee because it is your bill now. Um, and I will concede with whatever recommendations, uh, Delegate Amphrey or Delegate Fisher or any of you want to careful, Senator. Yeah, no, 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 don't go too far. No, we were elected together, so you know, and he's still here. We're still standing strong. So, uh, you know, so uh, you know, I respect, I respect that. And and look, this is genuinely, you know, I've never this this is honestly a piece of legislation that is going to help some businesses, and so. I just would love us to figure out how to do it. And with that, Delegate Fisher. <laughs> Hit the glass ceiling, that's the problem. So, uh, <laughs> how are you? The question, <laughs> question I have is, um, the an LLC I think now can just have a bunch of members and do the same thing. The members can be part owners by definition, right? Again, you need to direct those okay. that to the. My next question is: Is would the bill allow a an existing LLC to convert to a Maryland Limited Worker Cooperative LLC? Uh, uh, please, panelists, I, you're my experts. That's why you're here. Please answer. Yes, there. Um, it would be. Uh, we specifically incorporated into the bill that um, if there is a worker cooperative that is currently incorporated as an LLC, they would be able to convert to an LWCA. Okay. And then lastly, it's it's always the unintended consequences. Um, so in this committee, we see bills, uh, the fair scheduling act, um, hasn't passed uh, yet, thankfully, but we see bills like the leave act, different leave bills, where increasingly the flexibility of an owner of a company is being taken away. Um, and uh, one mandate after another, that's anti-business. And my concern about this is, is that it, it feels it feels like with all these bills that are coming forward that are anti-business that this could force the entrepreneurs out by just saying it doesn't pay to be a business owner so we're just going to kind of like socialize the business world and turn it into you know a worker's paradise um, mm. and it's kind of what it feels like a little bit mm. um it's funny because for me i was excited because it was actually the exact opposite that i you know, I've never put in a piece of uh, legislation that was like, here, I want the business owner to do exactly what they want to do, how they want to organize, how they choose to uh, to hire their employees, how they do. And so this to me is the, <laughs> frankly, the, you know, the, the opposite of that. Okay. It's because it's not, it's not, it's providing an option to organize your capitalist enterprise. <laughs> And that's what this is. So. Got it. Thank you. I agree. It doesn't sound like central planning at all. <laughs> Delegate get Charcutian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for your work on this bill. As uh, you know, I have followed this and I think it's uh, extremely important. And I have talked to a lot of uh, workers, business owners, co-ops, folks who have tried to establish worker co-ops and um all over the political spectrum, people who have tried to establish worker co-ops because they think it's the best model for what it is they're trying to accomplish. And they have repeatedly run into 
um, some of these barriers. I'll just actually mention, uh, same with housing co-ops that I might bring this bill, that bill next year, um, because our structures just sort of, there's the, the round peg square hole. So thank you for taking this on and thank you for all the work. I, I know there was a ton of work with the um, MSBA, the folks who have sent this letter throughout the summer. And I also know that there was work with uh, workers' rights groups to make sure that you didn't inadvertently create, I mean, some of the concerns that were raised inadvertently create like loopholes for that, you know, didn't protect workers. So I appreciate all that progress. And I guess my question is, as I followed, as I followed the uh, concerns from the MSBA, it has felt like it's mostly like we prefer this model law of ours rather than at this point. I mean, I know there was a lot of really legitimate stuff and I see that you've incorporated it in the changes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like there's a specific concern left other than we just prefer it this way. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, uh, and maybe this is to Miss Evans Goldstein, you mentioned a 30 other states. I'm curious about how, or however many other states, how well, and obviously Maryland law is different from other states, but some of the concerns um, Delegate Ampre raised, how well, like what we have in this proposed law that addresses federal tax concerns that maybe, because we've seen in 30 other states, how their laws also are under the federal government, even if they're not yeah. in Maryland. So I just want, um, Hopefully that question is clear, but it seems to me if 30 states have a law that's similar to this, that addresses federal tax issues, then maybe we learn from them and maybe we already have and it's already in this bill, or maybe it tells us what amendment is, is left to do. Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, you are correct. Uh, 30 other states have similar legislation, the first dating back to the 80s, which was Massachusetts. Um, the most recent being the Illinois statute that I mentioned, um, which was uh, gone into effect in 2020. And so over those decades, um, you know, all of the states have been working with the federal government, all of the business entities that have incorporated as LWCAs in other states um, have not run into any federal tax issues. Um, and our legislation is based off of the most recent iteration of an LWCA statute, which was the Illinois law. And so um, part of our process was taking the most recent iteration of this kind of statute um, and adapting and adopting what would be most useful for Maryland. And so it is already learned from and um, you know incorporates all of the things that are needed from a federal standpoint. Thank you. Delia Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my friend for bringing this bill. Um, I just had a question. So I was looking online. So it looks like um, this passed through the Senate unanimous. Is that correct? Yes. And so um, I was looking at the makeup of JPR. So yes. there are quite a few attorneys yes. on there, correct? Yes. Thank you. Again, much. that's why this is 85 and it's taken this long to get it. <laughs> let it pass that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> It absolutely okay. passed. Yes. I all right. Support. Uh, seeing no further questions, that concludes this bill hearing. I hope all the future witnesses are as excited to hit the time <laughs> limit as you are, Mr. Litz. Thank Next, you all very much. I enjoyed the conversation. We will go to Senate Bill 244. Clean Indoor Act is the chair of. Okay. We'll wait for that. Next, we will go to my senator. S what? Oh, she here? Oh, my apologies. Are you from the department, sir? Yes. All right, go ahead. Still on Senate Bill 244. I tried to hook my senator up, but couldn't do so successfully. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Crosby, members of the committee. I'm Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman, uh, the Deputy Secretary for Public Health at the Maryland Department of Health, uh, here to testify on behalf of Senate Bill 244, Clean Indoor Act. Um, as you know, the Clean Indoor Air Act was passed in 2007, landmark legislation that prevented the public's exposure to secondhand smoke, amongst other issues. Uh, this is a departmental bill uh, that seeks to address the new landscape of smoking products by prohibiting the use of electronic smoking devices in public indoor spaces alongside combustible tobacco and cannabis. <clears throat> so in 2007, when the Clean Indoor Act was passed, ESDs, electronic smoking devices, were not yet widely available and were not defined as a tobacco product and were not yet popular among youth. Um, and so that's why they weren't included. And that's what we're looking to change now. 
The version of the bill that's in front of you differs from the one that you passed as HB 238. One of the difference, one of the two differences is that there's an amendment that updates the labor and employment article to give the Department of Labor the same authority in workplaces that the Department of Health has in public indoor spaces to enforce the Clean Indoor Air Act. The second item is a Senate introduced amendment to study the issue of licensed tobacconists receive, who receive alcoholic beverage licenses while also pausing the issuance of new alcoholic beverage licenses to tobacconists. Um, this is to study what is going on in that space and some of the differences that we're seeing in counties around the issue of what are incidental, uh, what is incidental business for these tobacconists. And then the last item is a proposed amendment that the department is putting forward on behalf of the Department of Transportation. Uh, they had expressed concern about the effective date and the cost for signage. And so the proposed amendment is a two, expands the time frame for compliance to two years. <clears throat> Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, and I'm happy to take any questions and hope you return a favorable report. Doctor, thank you, and I apologize. Uh, seeing no questions, that concludes this hearing. Next, we will go to my senator, Senator Bailey, Senate Bill 429. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the committee, Senator Bailey representing St. Mary's and Calvert County, District 29. I'm also accompanied by Senator Anthony Muse, who is here. When you take a look at the bill that we're going to talk about today, Senate Bill 429, <clears throat> the main portion of this bill is exactly identical to House Bill 391, which you and this committee uh, had, and you also had it, and it passed the House of Delegates. There was an amendment to this bill that on the Senate floor to include a study by the State Department of Asset and Taxation to report to the General Assembly on the impact of repealing the requirement of corporations and associated articles that certain assets owned by the Methodist Church be held by the trustees of the church in trust for the United Methodist Church. SDAT would also study the restrictions of 5.327 of the corporations and associated articles on a deed or conveyance executed before June 1, 1953. That does not include a trust clause. I respect a favorable report, but I would stand and this is good senator from Prince George's County will help me answer any questions as this was his amendment. Man, Fisher, you're getting all the love today. Is that your bill, right? Okay. Doug Pruski. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one, one quick question, because the amendment is requiring a state agency as SDAT to do a study. Were they conferred with and they know it, about the yes, study? Yes, they know about the study. We passed it out of the uh, Senate and out of out of my committee and out of the Senate. Um, just a, a minute of a background on that. I have also been for many years a professor of church politics and particularly started out with the United Methodists, helped to write their book, et cetera. There's a problem that's developed because they're now split. As they have split, the question is, and this is what I'm getting from many judges who are having congregations come before them, why is something that is church law codified in our law? So I just want the study to come together so you can hear from both sides Judges and all else can give their input as to how do we move ahead in a fair and equitable way for those who have chosen to go with this section of the Methodist Church, that part of the Methodist Church, or this set. That's all it does. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. I'm, I guess maybe I'm not clear on Estat. Why is it Estat doing the study? What's the What's the question that Estat is? Because it's, it because it wasn't to be a task force. We didn't want to understand that. But what is the question that they're answering? The question that they're answering is: first of all, should this a uh, clause remain codified in church in, in 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 the state law? It was in 1968 when. Go ahead. Sorry, I. I do. I understand. We had the Help hearing. So I, like, I understand what the what the bill did. I'm just trying to figure out who the right people are to answer the question. Oh, I, so I I'm trying you. to figure out how 
ESTAT, which could tell us what the tax implications are for the split or whatever it might be, how are they going to tell us whether we should have voted for that bill or not? Now, that was without our Senate president decided that, that it should be done by them. Of all and the they're going to advise us on whether that's... No, case. they're going to just collect the information. They're not going to advise us on anything. Sorry, I'm... I just I don't what 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 information are they going to like they're going to interview people involved in the they're going to interview people I'm sure yes, they're going to interview people involved they'll, in, they'll interview judges they'll interview I'm sure bishops in the Methodist Church they'll interview uh, prominent lay people from each sector that it's now been just about a year since they split and the question is what do we do with the property relative to this one clause and study that property be held in trust by the United Methodist Church. How did it come to be? What's its relevance today? And how do we move forward considering that it's not the same United Methodist Church that it was then? So they're going to tell us about the history of the clause. Correct. They're going to get opinions from people from a range of opinions. That's correct. And they are going to recommend an outcome? No, they'll provide us with a study and from the study, we and you will have that study will then determine and make some recommendations. This comes with no preconceived notions except why and how and how is it codified and why was it done in 1968 and what is its relevance to now what has occurred in the Methodist Church, which I have no opinion on one or the other, but there are some who decide that I want to stay with my property. But uh, and the biggest question is how how is it that not that the way it's set up now, uh, the bill that you had before you that I've attached this to is a bill that says, should it be three members or five members? Who makes the decisions for the congregation? In this case, the congregants have no choice in the matter. And we just want to figure out how do you neutralize that in light of, of what's, what's occurred now. Okay. If I understand this study language, they're not going to make a recommendation. They're basically just going to tell us information about the property uh, and the money. So, uh, okay. Thank I mean, you. we look forward to that report uh, if it makes it. Um, Delegate Adams. Yeah. So I walked out just a minute ago and this may have been already asked, but when we had uh, the House bill in, the, in our subcommittee, the question was whether we should be involved in taking any action while there's a legal proceeding. So if that's already been answered. I'll just stop. But um, I know this is a different bill because it sounds like this is a study or a task force that's looking. It's not a task it. force. It's simply going to be a study because we didn't want to put people together that were involved in it yet until we could get the study and the background and the history of how this came to be, what it meant, and any, what it means now. So do you have any concerns with even passing something like this while there are two parties in court trying to adjudicate? Matters? I don't know what the relevance See, The two parties are not. It's the Episcopal Church. That's the bill that deals with the Episcopal Church that has, is that correct? Well, this may be a different bill. I might be getting it wrong. No, this is just an amendment. To, it is. Two bills, and you're on the right track here. Okay. Um, All right. So you, back to my senator, Senator Bailey. The initial bill originated out of an, uh, a church on Great Mills Road, correct? And that part of it, well, I mean, it's the whole diocese. Um, and it was it's Delegate Morgan's bill in here, Correct. That is correct. And okay. There's there's 51 churches. When we talk about the Episcopal Church, there, there's 51 churches and we've got three dioceses, right? You've got the Diocese of Easton, you've got the Diocese yeah. of Maryland, and you've got the uh, Diocese of Washington that cover all the counties. Two of the three um, are codified. Yep. The Episcopal Diocese of Washington is not codified. And so the issue was not really a big deal until the last couple of years. And what happened is when these dioceses tried to borrow money, um, as they were borrowing money to expand their churches, the um, actually the lenders found out that it was not codified. So they would no longer loan them money. Right. And so that is why we're here. Everybody else was codified. This originally started in, in that regard. Yeah. So and I think that that initial part of the bill, which flew out of here uh, on Delegate Morgan, I, I don't think that there's much contention or discussion or debate surrounding that. 
it is the second part, which was another bill that was amended into this bill. And we will pray over it uh, and deliberate uh, and <laughs> we'll see if that makes it to the finish line. What, what, we'll see if it gets through the pearly gates. I want to thank you very much. And as, right. as, as always, when we give you a bill, it's now your committee's bill. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. We will try to help you out, Senator. Okay. That concludes this bill hearing. Next, we will go to Senator Guile, a House bill. You got the next two, Senator. So uh, we'll start with Senate Bill 539. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. It's a little low. <clears throat> um, Senate Bill 539 was cross-filed with House Bill 701, which was uh, with the um, chair of this committee as a sponsor. As introduced, these bills would have limited resale of tickets to original purchase price, including fees and taxes, would have limited the fees charged by resale sites to 10%, would have required transferability for most tickets made available to the general public, required resellers to share ticket buyers' contact information with resale ticket purchasers in case of cancellation or schedule change, would have required ticket sellers to offer all-in pricing with an itemized list of all charges and would have banned speculative tickets. So this bill was basically a response to a lot of the um, news we've seen recently uh, with respect to Taylor Swift concerts and others, Bruce Springsteen and more. Um, we worked on the bill ultimately where we landed, um, the bill that is now before you is Senate Bill 539. Um, will require all in ticket prices. So this is, you know, be, once you, even before you get to that last page, you know, when you go to a shop for tickets and um, it doesn't list all those fees, then you get to the last page and then all, there's all, all of a sudden there's all these hidden fees. So it would require all in ticket prices. It would also uh, ban the sale of speculative tickets. These are uh, tickets that people don't even own um, and that they sell on a resale market um, creating this false sense of urgency, driving up ticket prices. So it banned those sale. Right now in Maryland, we only have a disclosure requirement. And then um, there would also, one one of the amendments that came through a committee would also set up as, uh, um, requirements for refund for tickets uh, so that if the show is canceled, things of that nature, you can get your money back. And then uh, finally, it would uh, put a study in the um, Office of the Attorney General Consumer Protection Division to examine uh, the ticket market here in Maryland um, to form future potential legislation on the issue. Um, so it, it's my hope that um, with the findings of the study, the General Assembly can return next session to uh, address any remaining issues. And I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 539. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you so much, Senator, for bringing the bill. I'm pretty sure all the Swifties in Maryland are going to be very happy once this passes. I've got a 13-year-old daughter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, he here's the question I have as I was reading through this last night. Uh, we have on page three, we kind of define ticket issuer, and we go into a whole bunch of sports teams, sports league, but then you get to number six, and we talk about a theater company. Are we talking about like a local movie theater? Or are we talking about plays? Can you kind of define what Theater sure. I understand that after this bill is passed, and we've since heard from movie theaters that have raised concerns about this. Um, you know, obviously, when we when we originally drafted this bill, this intent was more so looking at um, the issues that we've seen, particularly with like Ticketmaster and others that what about a lot of the complaints that people have had that you go to buy a ticket, you get to the last page, and then all of a sudden there's all these junk fees and hidden fees being added. And it was more in the context as far as like live ticket shows. Since then, since we've just received these uh, this letter from the certain theater companies and reaching out movie theater companies, I am, I'm a little bit confused though why they can't comply. Like what kind of hidden fees did they have that they want to somehow be exempt. I'm also unaware of um, any speculative tickets even being sold for movie theater tickets. So I'm just, I'm, I don't quite understand where their concern is. Um, that said, if it's, you know, the decision of this committee in order to somehow make some sort of clarifying language with the with the bill, I'd leave it to this committee's uh, good judgment. Yeah, you know, I have a local movie, I have three local movie theaters in my district, right? I don't think anyone's reselling movie tickets, right? I mean, as you know, movie tickets right. have been going down, but uh, sorry, uh, sorry, go ahead, Senator. 
Uh, no, I was just going to say, but to be clear, that that all in front, uh, all upfront ticket pricing, that's applicable to also a primary market, not not just for a resale. But I agree with you. I really doubt people are reselling their movie yeah, tickets. Right. So we could talk offline about what we can do to kind of get some clarifying sure. language here as well. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, Senator, this bill had a lot of debate in our committee. Um, so I'm curious. Has the bill moved with support from all the people that came in and opposed it uh, when we had it? So in other words, is, it, is, it, is, it, is this bill reconciled? Um, so uh, the, the original, the, a lot of the uproar that you heard at the outset was really from the secondary ticket market, and that was with respect to caps. Um, uh, there was a lot of concern because it would, you know, admittedly, effectively, it would remove that incentive on the you know, for ticket brokers in order to buy up a bunch of tickets and make a ton of money. And I was still very much wanted to see that cap happen. But I realized that a lot of their opposition to that was that it would effectively gut a lot of their business. And so that's where the, a lot of that uh, that um, opposition was with respect to that. I know that in working with uh, with with certain groups that there was. Um, the, the concept of the all-in ticket pricing wasn't a lot of opposition to. There's some concern about the language of it, but I think that, you know, and then banning the sale of ticket, the speculative tickets, there was con some concern raised by sports teams, Ravens and Orioles and the like. However, we made sure that that was clear, at least in the bill, that speculative tickets doesn't contemplate, like if you're a season ticket holder and your team gets to the playoffs, you still have, custody control legal right to those tickets for the playoffs. Therefore, that's not a speculative ticket. Um, so that's what was the, some concern. I don't think that the, based on this bill, with this bill is, I don't think that these um, some of these companies are all going to come together and say we're all in support of this at this point. Well, I mean, <clears throat> what, what I'm concerned about, I'm a commander's fan, and sometimes I sell my tickets and go with some friends that may be in the room here. So sure. I want to be able to sell my ticket to the Cowboys game, which is going to go for more than mm -hmm. they're going to play the Bengals this year. So yep. the, the point is that I, I will likely get what the market bears for for that ticket. That's the marketplace. So that's the secondary market. You're telling me that this bill uh, has no relevance in the secondary market. Well, there there are components of this bill that are also applicable to the secondary market, to be clear, including the all-in ticket prices, the ban on speculative tickets. However, to your point, you can sell your tickets. There's nothing in this bill that inhibits you from selling your commander's tickets for four times more than what, the fa what you got them for. But you see, I use platforms that actually have the footprint that charges the fees, I believe. So for right. example, I mean... Uh, I just know I use the commanders because it's an example. Sure. Uh, the, 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 hey. He has arrived. <laughs> uh, <laughs> way to make an entrance. I, I, SeatGeek is the name of the, the, the platform. Yep. So I, I put them on the market and I say, this is what I want to sell them for. I'm not sure what happens on the other side, whether there's a fee charge or not. All I can tell you is that when I put it on there at the price that I'd like to sell it for it doesn't take long for them to sell i get the money they mm -hmm. get the tickets and that doesn't the right of that company that i'm using the name of whether it's Ticketmaster or whether it's seat geek has a right to make a a return that's a valuable platform i have mm -hmm. a valuable commodity uh you're putting my commodity in front of a a buyer that's a valuable transaction and when you say junk fees i'm like okay i hear you because some of them can be expensive but I, I don't know that i inherently call them a junk fee but I'm, I'm let me just go back to the question you don't really care about what, what I do as a secondary um, seller in the marketplace. If I use SeatGeek and they charge the buyer, whatever, that, what does it matter? If, if somebody buys it, they bought it, right? I'm trying to understand your question. So, uh, I'm so, sorry. <laughs> so you, you yourself, I, I, I want to be able to sell my, I want to be able to sell my tickets right. on platforms that are available to me. Right. Um, and I want the marketplace to be dynamic, which means I don't want to see these companies go away or have some right. reason for not wanting to offer the service. That's all this question goes to. Yeah, so the, the a lot of, a lot of these with with some work that's been done federally. A lot of them also already are. For example, Ticketmaster. I know you can toggle back and forth between showing all the fees or not. Um, some are already compliant. So this would basically mean if you if you go if you want to sell your tickets, if you got them for like a hundred dollars, and you're going to sell them for I don't know two hundred dollars on that secondary market, 
Um, if they add any fees onto that, they would just have to list that on the main page. In addition to that, seat location, you just need to know it's it's for the importance of consumers being able to comparison shop, know what they're looking for, know what they're getting to, where's the seat number, where's the location, just more transparency in that ticket uh, up front. Thank you for answering the question. Sure. Thank you. That concludes this hearing. Senator Gow, you are up next. Senate Bill 541. Small bill, very small bill. Um, Senate Bill uh, 541 uh, was is a bill that was um, cross-filed here in, um, by Delegate Sarah Love, House Bill 567, which this committee reported favorably and which passed the House of Delegates. Um, considerable amount of work was being has been done on these two bills. Um, very much appreciate the good work that was done by um, by Delegate Love as well as this committee. Uh, the two bills are in somewhat different posture, um, and uh, but we are having ongoing conversations between our Senate Finance Committee as well as here in this committee in order to work out those differences. And I'm confident that we will get there um, over the coming week and a half. And so I would just request a favorable report on Senate Bill 541. Uh, thank you, Senator Gow. So to help us with this, since we have spent a lot of time on the, the uh, House version of this bill, can you tell me what those differences are roughly <laughs> so that I can yeah. look out for them? Um, I, I can, um, Delegate. Um, I have a, um, looks like a, maybe a 10 page uh, document. 10 pages chart, of differences? Uh, 10 pages that outlines the differences. That we're going to get um, to in a couple of weeks. So the, as I mentioned, there's a lot of things that are being worked out between the respective committees. There are some things that are non-substantive drafting differences. Um, these are also, there's some differences between some of the definitional language. Um, there are- Can we um, just do the substantive ones? Substantive ones? Sure. Um, I'll go through them line by line. Um, and I'm happy to share this. I think at least it was shared with counsel for the committee. Um, so starting with the first, 14-4601D, um, biometric data on the Senate bill includes any other unique biological characteristics that are used to uniquely authenticate a consumer's identity in the House bill. That language is biometric data includes any other unique biological characteristics that can be used to unique, uniquely authenticate a consumer's identity. The next one is um, we took some of the MIA amendments. Uh, these were uh, certain requests in order to, what MIA spoke to us about was that they That's, felt as though- You don't have to go a lot that much detail. I got the MIA Do amendments you, in the next one. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. We took the MIA amendments. Precise geolocation data was amended so that it does not include ge data generated by equipment used by a utility company. In the House bill, it's precise geolocation data does not include equipment used by a utility company. I think the problem was there was just simply a drafting mistake in the House bill. It says precise geolocation does not include equipment, whereas in the Senate bill, it was data generated by that equipment. Um, in the House bill, there's a adds a definition of transfer. So it means to disclose, release, disseminate, make available, license, rent, or share personal data orally and writing electronically or by any other means. Um, there was um, there's a, a just a slight difference as far as the applicability, and this is just a drafting difference as far as what size of the business it is. So I won't necessarily go through that one. Okay. Um, there is a difference between um, originally the uh, uh, there was a request to add a lot of the applicability of the um, certain data minimization to both a controller and a processor. Later, based on discussions that we had with Amazon World Services, we ended up drop, uh, dropping that or processor language. And part of that reason is because there's already an agreement to a controller and a processor as to how the controller directs how that processor should use that. Um, that data in communication with Delegate Love, it's my understanding that she submitted to this committee to um, go ahead and accept that version of, of dropping that and processor language. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> oh, we took uh, the amendment from NICB. 
Um, basically, this is, you know, the entity that investigates um, insurance fraud, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they wanted to be exempt from it. Uh, so we took that amendment from NICB. Um, there's some differences in de-identified data language. <clears throat> Um, we have a provision that strikes a requirement that a controller notify the consumer within 30 days after complying with the consumer's request that the controller has complied with the consumer's request. Um, the house version retains that requirement. Um, there was one uh, difference between, um, uh, which I think the house version, I prefer there's a, 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 with respect to children, the, the Senate bill that was originally drafted. And, and I would caveat this by saying um, at the outset, we worked extremely, both delegate and I, Doug at Love and I worked very closely on all these bills. And okay. both They've given me the list. Thank you. Okay, good. Delegate Queen, I can keep we'll going. make sure we get uh, the list that was sent out. I, the, I, I assume Delegate Love has it. I, I'll reach out to Delegate Love's office, Senator, get it and sure. distribute it to committee members. Okay, thank you. Delegate Adams. Thank you, Chair. So there is a lot to this bill, and I only have one question. Sure. It relates to private right of action. Mm -hmm. When uh, Delegate Rose came in, uh, I remember her giving her testimony. You know, a lot of people were concerned about private, private right of action. You should be good with the bill because I removed private right of action. That was her uh, not verbatim quote, but that was her point. So when I see the bill in the Senate form, uh, it looks like to me you took a, the right to cure, which is a important component. But in the bill, and I shared this with the chairman in the House version, it sits here in the Senate version, it says that this section does not prevent a consumer per, from pursuing any other remedy provided by law. And I guess mm -hmm. my question is, and it's really just a clarifying question, would you be against the idea of having maybe legislative intent language that says that nothing under the subtitle shall imply that the, that anyone has a right, private right of action. And, and, yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, that's, I, I appreciate you bringing that um, be, up because, you know, private right of action was something that I was really concerned about even before I agreed to cross file this bill is I did want to have that private right of action in there. And I, we've had lots of discussions about that language and about, whether or not it's uh, tight enough to specifically exclude that. I, I, this is, uh, you know, for, for the record, the legislative intent here is indeed to remove that private right of action. And to the extent this committee has any sort of clarifying language they wanted to include to make sure that that was, you know, um, very clear, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Okay, that, that's what, that was just one that was important for me, but thank you. Sure, thank you, Delegate. Okay, seeing no further questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Thank you, Senator. Next three bills, we will go to Senator Kramer. Start with 571. I hear that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Did you say Senate Bill 571? <laughs> you know, I I do have feelings. It it may not often appear that way, but but I I do I do have feelings. Um actually uh Mr. Chair colleagues Ben Kramer here to introduce Senate Bill 571 which I think is going to move pretty quickly Mr. Chair because this is the cross-file to House Bill 603, sponsored by uh, the chair of the committee and Delegate Solomon. The bills are in almost identical uh, posture. There was one amendment that came over from the House, um, and we are going to, uh, we've already passed the bill in uh, Senate Finance Committee, uh, with that amendment, so um, we're we're fine with the amendment. It's a good thing, and uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. But um, you all have already heard quite a bit about that bill. Seeing no questions, that concludes this bill hearing. Next, we will do Senate Bill 760. All right. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Ben Kramer, introducing um, 
Senate Bill 760, which is a cross file to House Bill 896. Uh, Delegate Stewart, you all have heard uh, this bill. Colleagues, this bill actually is going to make a significant change in the way the gift card industry operates. Um, it turns out that there uh, was roughly $225 million worth of gift card fraud last year alone um, from gift cards being stolen from stores. The information, the numbers that are on the cards captured by the scammers, and then the cards are put back onto the racks. And the moment money is placed on those gift cards, the money is sucked off by the scammers. Uh, the consumers are left holding the bag, and uh, the bill before you addresses that to ensure that there's appropriate packaging to secure uh, the important numbers on the gift cards, provide evidence of tampering. Um, there was an amendment uh, other than this one amendment that was adopted here in the House, Mr. Chair. The bills, I believe, are in the same form. Now, having said that, uh, the industry came uh, with an amendment that makes sense um, that's being drafted now. It'll be provided to this committee. We're also going to take it up on the Senate side. Um, I know very late in the game, um, the one of the really bad industry players showed up looking to amend the bill. Um, it's a company called Incom. They are the uh, subject of multiple class action lawsuits, um, including lawsuits from the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. And uh, if you just Google income on any consumer website, you will see the literal thousands of complaints about this company. Uh, they've known that their packaging has been vulnerable, being exploited by the scammers, um, and yet they have continued to allow it to happen. And uh, so that's why there are so many lawsuits and litigation surrounding income. Um, and their products. Uh, but having said that, the rest of the industry has come to the table, worked with me, worked with the uh, House sponsor uh, to draft a good, solid bill. With that, I'm happy to take any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we are aware of the siphoning of funds uh, that are taking place. Delia Rose. Um, there were some concerns from the retailers has that been addressed in the amendments? I believe the retailers was the very first organization that I reached out to when I started contemplating the legislation. But sitting right behind me, we can get a nod of the head, Mr. Chair Committee. Okay, then I'm good. Done and done. Thank you for the question. Okay. All right. Seeing no further questions, that concludes this bill. Last, we will go to the final bill of the day, Senate Bill 1056, Senator Kramer. All righty then. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Ben Kramer here to introduce Senate Bill 1056, which is a cross file uh, to House Bill 1180, sponsored by the chair of this committee. Um, colleagues, just real fast, I'm going to hit the bullet points. And, uh, and then answer any questions. Um, this is really a important bill to address youth smoking and youth vaping, which is still a significant problem here in the state of Maryland. We have the, one of the highest rates of youth vaping in the country. Um, and uh, the bill before you, and part of that, colleagues, is that there's no money for doing inspections. So there's very, very few inspections happening. Typically, the way the process works is that uh, inspections of facilities that sell vape and cigarette products, tobacco products, um, are done by our local health departments and they get reimbursed uh, from the state for doing that. The problem is there's been no money 
from the state so the local health departments aren't bothering to do inspections. The bill before you seeks to address that and it raises the uh, licensing fee to $300 if you have a tobacco license so that we are generating funds that will go to the Maryland Department of Health and then find their way back to local health departments for doing inspections because that's critical in addressing the prevalence of uh, access to tobacco products by our youth, again, particularly vaping products. Um, <clears throat> the bill increases penalties for retailers that are caught selling tobacco products to minors and for the first time will allow a process for if there are multiple violations for a license to be suspended, um, if there's somebody who's a routine bad actor selling tobacco products to minors. Um, it would also uh, stop online sales of vape products. Um, very important, that's a real source of getting vape products into the hands of minors. Um, and then the two things that I think are going to be controversial, although they shouldn't be, um, the first is that vaping products in the state under the bill will be sold at vape licensed shops. And there's an important reason for that. And the statistics make it glaring. And that's why I'm hoping everybody please tune in and listen to these stats. Over the last two years, 80% of the few inspections that are actually happening 80% of those businesses selling vapes to minors were convenience stores and gas stations. 80%. The most significant source of vape products getting to underaged children smoking vape products. 80%. But that was not an anomaly of the last two years, colleagues, over the past eight years, the past eight years, 82% of the violators, again, were the gas stations and convenience stores selling vaping products to minors. If we are going to get serious about stopping the next generation of nicotine addicts, then we've got to start at how these children are getting the vape products. The statistic for the last two years and the last eight years for vape shops selling to minors, 2%, 2%. That's because if you're an adult and you believe you're, you know, that vaping may be a cessation device or you just like to do it, then you go to where you need to be 21 to step in the door. And that's the case at vape shops. So under the bill, we are making the policy decision that if we're going to legitimately try to stop this pandemic of vaping in Maryland youth, and by the way, statistics are overwhelming that if you are under 18 and you start vaping, you are three and a half to seven times more likely to then move on as an adult to traditional cigarettes. So the next wave, and by the way, Hopkins Medicine, every legitimate um, site dealing with, including centers of disease control, they are forecasting a tsunami of new combustible cigarette smokers because of the vaping epidemic. So the bill before you again would limit vape sales to where you need to be 21. There's no shortage of vape uh, businesses here. And let's get serious about this issue. Finally, colleagues, the other one is again, a policy decision and it would prohibit the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. And why would we do that? Pharmacies and pharmacists 
are where the public goes to seek health products, to find drugs to cure diseases that are caused by tobacco products. CVS did this voluntarily a number of years ago, and it's been long enough now that there are actual scientific studies that indicate that as a consequence of CVS just being a major chain, taking them out of the marketplace, the odds of people succeeding in quitting smoking has already begun to increase. And the same studies indicate that if it is done on a full scale basis, taking them out of pharmacies, the opportunities for people to succeed in quitting smoking will very likely increase dramatically. This is not unique. State of New York had all, has already done this a couple of years ago. Um, there are literally uh, hundreds of cities across the country that have taken this very same action. There are dozens of them in California. So this is definitely the trend. If somebody wants to go into a drugstore and find products to make them healthy, we don't want them having in their faces the very products that will give them myriad diseases and health problems. So uh, it's a policy decision. Um, I, I think if we're looking to do right by the residents of our state and the children and families of our state, I'm hoping that both of these provisions stay in the bill. Um, I'd hate to see that we choose big tobacco over the health of our children and those who are looking to quit nicotine uh, products. And, uh, and we had several people, because we had a full-blown bill hearing in the Senate, we had several folks from Baltimore City who have been trying to address stopping um, underage tobacco in Baltimore City. And they said, look, unequivocally, Big tobacco is targeting our communities, and they came in in full support of the bill because they want to see their children stop getting pulled into nicotine. With that, happy to take any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. How are you? I'm well. Thank you, ma'am. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Good. I appreciate um, the bill, the premise behind it. One of the, and, and particularly with the pharmacies, um, but one of the uh, we, the retailers um, have um, weighed in on a concern, not so much about pharmacies in and of themselves, but the grocery stores that have pharmacy components. And so this would then also include them. Um, how would you um, address or have you had a conversation with them about that particular concern? Um, any thoughts on that? I appreciate that. We have had committee counsel opine on the issue, and they indicated that they felt that under the existing statute, the way pharmacy licenses work, those that are in, for instance, the box stores, um, Costco and um, Walmart and uh, and in our groceries uh, that they would not be pulled under the bill. Um, so uh, I, I don't know whether there's a way to clarify that, but we did have committee counsel weigh in um, at both voting session and at the bill hearing on that and indicated that their impression is, yes, it would affect Walgreens and Rite Aid, but did not see it as uh, being an issue with box stores and groceries. Would um, a clarifying amendment that said, um, for lack of a better word, exclusively that it does not apply to, uh, let's say a retailer whose primary um, um, Business is sale of food products. Yeah. I I would not have a problem with that. The question is, would it be constitutional? And I'm not, I don't have the answer. But I mean, I certainly uh, would not be overly concerned about it. Um, 
I, you know, I, I was never contacted by any of our uh, friends from the groceries themselves. I know my good friends from the retailers have expressed some concern, but, um, you know, I, I suspect it's, it would not be a significant issue if it did end up affecting them. But again, um, it, it appears as though they might not be impacted by it. All right, thank you. But thank you for the question. Delegate it's Adams. a good one. Thank you. Delegate Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Mr. Free Market Guy comes to the uh to the Hi, point. Hi, buddy. <laughs> comes to the point where I ask the question. Um, we're not banning it, right? We don't ban tobacco products, we don't ban vape, but yet no. we appear to be willing to ban places where it can be purchased. Why not regulate? We do regulate them. Well, you, your testimony is that we're not regulating well enough. It's like some of the abuse or the fraud or the these things happen in a certain uh, venue or a certain retail right. establishment. That That is a enforcement issue. That's not a the state of Maryland should come in and just knock them out of the. I'll ask a follow up, but just your thoughts on my thoughts on that. Yes, it is a significant enforcement issue. And yet that enforcement consistently shows the violators are one segment of the industry, consistent, 82% from one industry. So that's not an anomaly, as I indicated. Yeah, they were there the last two years. They've been like that the last eight years. That's, how, that's, how, that's only as far back as I could get information. Um, well, let me it. just, if you don't mind, because I'll ask the second question and then we'll move on. The, the second question is, I'm not familiar with vape shops. I don't smoke. Most of my family does. And they're all using vape, by the way. It's no longer tobacco. Um, but I would imagine that some of my family members would not go to a vape shop, right? So Why not? Well, it, okay. Did you ask? Because them? they're consumers and they choose where they'd like to go do business. And, you, and under this bill, you're taking that choice away. I'll I'll ask your thought on that, and then I'll move on to some. Other I stuff. I don't think we're limiting their access. They're just be limited to where the business is geared towards the sale of a very specialized product, as opposed to where we know children are getting access to these products. So you they would go no into a vape shop. There's not another way to go about this. Say that again. There's not another way to go about this than to just say you can no longer sell it at these establishments? I think if we're going to be serious about trying to stop the huge amount of vaping products getting into the hands of children, we need to go to the source. And, and that's my whole point, delegate, with all due respect, the statistics overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly point to gas stations and convenience stores as to where our children are getting vape products. So it's not as if they've been willing to clean up their own act. And the bottom line is, if it's gonna make a difference and help stop the scourge of access to nicotine in our children, I think it's an appropriate uh, step to take. I just gotta say, Adams, I need, I need, I need that for my Class A license bill next year. That that argument you just brought forward, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, good, to, good to see you, Senator. Good as to always. see you, my friend. Um, so it sounds like uh, so Delegate Harrison took part of my question, but just want to get some more data understanding. So the data shows that the highest instances of youth getting access to vape is convenience stores and gas stations, or that was correct. So, so just to clarify, the data shows that it's not a major issue in the stores like grocery stores and our big box stores. So that's not where it's necessarily happening. I just want to clarify that the data you have indicates that, that that's not where they're getting access. Correct. Convenience stores and gas stations is where the vast majority of uh, violations have been occurring. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to make sure I got that clear. All right. Nope, thank you. you got it crystal clear. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Senator, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, um, always. Um, my my question a uh, little bit on all these things you just mentioned is, I think the bill's way overreach for something that is a problem. I, I detest smoking. I detest vaping. So, you know, but I, I also 
and pro-business. And I look at you're taking a market away from several groups to essentially benefit another market. And it's in one fell swoop. I, I think there's some remedies that could have been looked at for this and accountability. Like uh, I think Delegate Adams was mentioning, this is an enforcement issue. It's not necessarily a problem because people aren't doing their job on that side of it. And I'm wondering what what approach we, we do. it. We take, uh, if I go to a baseball game, I need ID to do that. And why aren't we looking at something a little less harsh to try to keep businesses functioning, try to keep businesses working and not take that revenue away from some of these smaller businesses? Why aren't we doing something like checking IDs and validating the ID at the point of sale? And that's a brilliant question. Thank and the you. problem, Delegate, is it's not happening. Well, so the industry that is not doing that, despite the fact we say, by law, you're required to do it, the very, and by the way, I'm also very pro-business, but I'm also very pro-family and pro-children and like to protect our children over big tobacco. So you're saying, why don't we require an ID check? We do require an ID check, but here's the problem. The same businesses that you're saying are in desperate need of having these sales are the same businesses that are not following the law and are continuously selling this particular product to our children. So and the I, bill before you is, hey, for this one, you want to go to the convenience store and you want to get uh, a slice of pizza or a little grilled sausage or a Slurpee or chips or a soda, God bless. But if you're going to keep selling vaping products in that same 7-Eleven to our children, let's take those vape products and put them in a more secure business model. And by the way, this is not going to be hurting a lot of businesses I'm guessing may well benefit at the end of the day, as at the same time, we're protecting our children from the source of the problem. It goes back to what we were talking about, enforcement. It's not necessarily a problem because we're not enforcing it. You can, we can keep blaming somebody for getting away with something only because we don't actually have an enforcement mechanism for that. And that's my point about this. You're going in here and you're saying, listen, it's the law. Don't do it. What do we do about it? Well, there's no there's nobody enforcing this. Do something about the enforcement part of it. Put the put the onus on those people that are committing the crimes. They're selling this stuff. These kids can go anywhere and do anything they want. And I just will say that I believe that this this bill is overreaching on something that is a problem for a lot of people. I don't have to have it, but it is a problem. But I think we're taking one big fell swoop. And, I, and I'll ask a question. What's next? Do we have cigarette only smoking stores that sell only cigarettes? That's, that's it. That's not this bill. It's not this bill, but essentially that's what that's the next step. Because then that'll the be, same people then that'll are, be a but, policy decision we take up That is at something the you're doing to one business, you're not doing it to another. And you're saying that this is the place that's doing it. I, I don't understand why we can't actually come into something that at least Put the mechanism in the check it, at least look at the way to do it without harming some of these businesses. And right. delicate to your point, you keep saying it's enforcement. If mm -hmm. the business is not violating the law, then they are not going to be cited. Yet, 82% of this industry yeah. are being cited because there is enforcement and it's not an anomaly over a year or two years. This is going back as far as I could get records. So they're being eight penalized, years consistently. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's uh, take a deep breath. You know we're we're just, yelling at each ben, other. Delia Weibel. Um, so you said 80, 82% of the convenience stores um, basically are in violation of gas stations, but those can still get a license under this bill, a vape license? They would not have vape products. And they're not. They, they will have. They can still. And they get are cigarettes. precluded from getting a license. They would not. They would not have a vape license. Vaping would be uh, for sale in vape businesses. So a convenience store couldn't open up a vape business right next door. They. I mean, if a convenience store wanted to open a vaping business, I don't think, you know, well, if they're selling the product now, what's it. precluding them? They from... wouldn't sell the product within the convenience store, though. Do you follow what I'm saying? No. So the in bill, a vape business, the... you have to be 21 to go in. 
So they because couldn't just put a little side business next to their convenience store and sell vape products. I'm guessing they could absolutely. If if 7-Eleven wants to go into vaping, then I'm sure they could get a vape license okay. and go into business right next door. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Nothing would prove Senator, that. quick question for you, right? It's 80, 82% throwing out these numbers. Uh, what is the percentage of convenience stores that sell in the market, right? So if they're 99% of the sellers, but only 80% of the problem, then you could make on rate base that if 1% of the sellers were vape shops and were 2% of the problem, then they're just shy 2.5% worse offenders than convenience stores. I got the prevalence argument, but I'm talking about the rate. Great question. Saturation of the marketplace is a huge part of the problem um, with tobacco products. And yes, saturation is much higher when they're available in all the gas stations and the convenience stores. And again, the testimony that we heard from our friends from Baltimore, they were saying saturation is much greater in uh, minority communities, and they actually broke it out into not just minority communities, but lower income communities where the saturation rates are the highest. And so your point is very well taken that yes, um, saturation is a, an issue, and yes, convenience stores do provide much greater saturation and gas stations in the marketplace with tobacco products. Understand the saturation argument. Got it. Wasn't the question. The question was, what is the percentage of convenience stores that sell in the market? I wouldn't have any idea how many convenience okay. stores actually have uh, sought okay. out vape licenses. No clue. All right. Last bite of the apple. Doug at Adams. All right. Before the baseball game. So <clears throat> Go I've got over. another question on the theme of the 82% which is we're a state of 6 million people, okay? So what are the raw numbers that you're deriving from? So it, don't tell me 82, and you might have to come back to me with the information, which is fine. Don't tell me the percentage. Tell me the actual numbers that we're talking about. Is it 100? Is it 10,000? And the reason why I ask is if we have a real uh, problem, if there's this pandemic of abuse and fraud under this uh, the rationale why this bill exists, I'd like to know, are we talking about 100 violations per year or whether we're talking about 10,000? If we've got a real problem, I'm going to expect it to be closer to 10,000. My guess is that the statistics are going to lead me more to that there are a few I hundred. think the question is, what are the percentages of youth vaping? And that Maryland is at a much higher percentage of youth vaping than the majority of states are. And by the way, colleagues, and I'll just wrap it up. I know it was the last bite at the apple. Um, we are about to uh, jeopardize federal funds because we will now be exceeding federal requirements for preventing youth sales of tobacco products. So for fiscal year 2023-24, we are now going to be in violation because our rates of selling to minors are way in excess of federal standards, which puts all kinds of federal funds in jeopardy. But Mr. Sen Senator, so we we Senator do Ernst have we legitimately do have a so, problem. Well, so that's why I asked the question is because that was a bill before us. And I think you were in the House of Delegates then, and it did relate to smoking. And the answer was enforcement. The, the answer was not to say we're not going to let you sell cigarettes in approved locations in the state. It was to say that we have an enforcement issue. That that was the resolution to that federal component a number of years ago. So I go back to I'm just curious as to the raw numbers. I, I think I'd, we'll I'd be curious. disagree on that. Okay. All right. There'll be much more debate about this. That concludes this bill hearing and the bills for today. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Hi, buddy.
didn't hear any mention of the amendment I sent you. I did say there was an amendment. I think it was on this one. I don't think I discussed. Wait a minute. On this one. Yeah, I said there was. On one of them, I know I said there's an amendment that would be coming. Hi, buddy. I haven't heard back from you about that. 